Well, as many of you might know, my family, growing up, we grew up right in the middle of the state of Maryland. Maryland. That's where I grew up. We could drive a few hours east and be swimming in the beach in the summer. It was so wonderful. We could drive just a few hours west and we could be hitting the slopes in the Appalachian Mountains. We lived right in the middle of Maryland. A few hours one way, go to the beach. A few hours the other way, go skiing, snowboarding. My favorite places to vacation were actually at these campgrounds near the beach. You could swim all day at the beach and then hop in the van and you could drive back to your campsite. Of course, mom would make sure that there were towels on the seats. Now, we would drive back and we would drive to a campsite in the middle of this pine tree forest and we would have a wonderful campfire where we would warm ourselves, fill our bellies with roasted marshmallows and s'mores. It was great, best of both worlds, had the beach and camping. Now, while at the beach, you could have seen the joy written on an eight-year-old boy's face, running toward the beach with a boogie board strap tied around his wrist, shirt off, shoes off, sprinting for the water. And then that face, full of joy, turns to sheer horror as that burning hot sand feels like molted lava between his toes. Shouts of joy turn quickly into just shouts of pain and breathing like you're in a Lamaze class. Brothers and sisters, I don't know about you, but my joy both then and now often comes just as fast as it goes. It's fleeting. It's like catching and riding the biggest wave of your life, only to be tumbled head over heels across the bottom of the ocean floor. Any of you that ever bodied surf would know what I'm talking about. Your face dragging across the ocean floor, all cut up by seashells and rocks. Sand after you get up in places that you'd rather it not be, right? (laughs) Our joy is often spoiled by sin. Death robs us of the joy of life. Wicked hearts ruin relationships. Sin spoils our fun. Sickness leaves us home. Broken bones wrapped in a cast and on the sidelines. The curse of sin affects our bodies and our world. The joy of the weekend, even, when the alarm clock sounds on Monday morning, flees. The joy of a vacation ends when you pack it up and head home. All good things seem to always come to an end, and so does our joy. However, our text today in Isaiah 35, if you want to turn there, speaks of everlasting joy. Joy without end, joy that will not fade away, joy that will last forever. But this joy does not come to a people who already have it all together. (laughs) This joy is not just a cherry on top of an already good life. This joy comes to an unexpected place, to an unexpected people. This everlasting joy comes not from the beach or the mountains, but from a desert wasteland. This joy comes to those who have nothing but hope. Hope that when God comes, there will be healing of all sickness. There will be rejoicing instead of mourning. There will be joy without end. Everlasting joy, which is found in the return of their everlasting God. This fourth Advent message, we focus our attention to the hope of the world and the everlasting joy that Jesus brings. Isaiah foretells of this, that when the Savior comes, not only will the people shout for joy, but even the wilderness will rejoice. Look with me in verses 1 and 2. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. It shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Let's take just a moment, look back at verse one. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. What in the world is a crocus? 
It's actually a type of flower. Well, why not just say that it shall blossom like a flower? Why so specific, this type of flower? Well, interesting enough, this Hebrew word is only used twice in the Old Testament. The ESV translate it, crocus here in Isaiah, but rose in Song of Solomon. So I'm like, which one is it? Is it a crocus or is it a rose? I can only suppose the reason why they translate it one way crocus and the other way rose is because in the Song of Solomon, it's a love letter, right? And the rose of Sharon sounds a lot better than the crocus of Sharon. <laughs> but why might it be important to call this flower uniquely by its name a crocus? Why, what, what is a crocus and why might that be so important? It actually fits the context really well. In many regions, the true arrival of spring is marked by the appearance of the crocus flowers. It's one of the earliest bloomers in spring. They can often be seen even peeking up through the snow. You could Google it, crocus peeking through the snow, and this will be a blooming flower. And they do so, so early on <laughs> that it comes through the snow and it blooms before any other flower appears on the landscape. Isaiah says, the wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice, the whole desert, the entire thing, shall rejoice and blossom like the crocus. The sign that winter will soon have to give way to spring. Death give way to life. Isaiah personifies the desert. He says that the desert shall rejoice and blossom abundantly with joy and singing. Isaiah 35 verse 2. It shall blossom abundantly, rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. So what is he saying here? He's saying that the region and the place which has no glory, it's a dry wasteland. It has no attractions, okay? There's no reason for anyone to travel to it, only through it. That desolate dry land will be given glory, the glory of Lebanon, the mountains, and the sea. The glory of Lebanon. What is Lebanon? Well, it is a place today, Lebanon, distinct from Syria. And one of the things that distingu distinguishes the two, the boundary, is the mountain range. Okay, so Lebanon the, 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 is this mountain range, a huge mountain range. And on it has the cedars of Lebanon. So if you see that in the book of the Psalms and other places, these strong cedars. It's just north of the Sea of Galilee. So he says, the glory of all the mountains of Lebanon shall be given to this desert wasteland. He says, the majesty of Carmel, which means fruitful, fruitful land or garden, even vineyard. The glory of a fruitful land, a garden shall be given to this wilderness wasteland. And the majesty of Sharon, the coastal plains there in the Mediterranean, shall also be given to it. All the most glorious, most beautiful places that you could visit in the Middle East, Isaiah says, all of their glory shall be given to the dry and desolate land. For in that place, why? For in that place, they shall see the glory of the Lord and the majesty of our God. I mean, that's true, right? That place in the Middle East, did they not see the glory of of the Lord, did his feet not trod upon that ground? The glory of the Lord and the majesty of our God, indeed, even the wilderness, sang and rejoiced. Why should the wilderness and all the people who dwell there rejoice? Isaiah tells them, it's because your God will come and save you. Isaiah often focuses us towards a second Exodus motif, and we do see that here. Throughout the book of Isaiah, it's interesting, many people actually say that Isaiah, they'll call it the gospel according to Isaiah. Have you ever heard that? The gospel according, because you have the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, right? Well, if you go to Isaiah, this, this thing reads like one of the gospels with how much Isaiah foretells of the coming of Christ and what that will be like. And he often describes it as a second exodus. He tells often of the wilderness becoming like a garden. That God's people will experience a second exodus, not just salvation from slavery in Egypt, but salvation from the wilderness of their sin. This second exodus is mixed a bit with the new creation. Adam and Eve were separated from God, and they needed to be saved from the wilderness 
where their sin had led them. Now don't forget, Adam's sin also led to the curse of the whole world. The whole earth was cursed. Their earth was cursed. Their bodies were cursed. Their sin not only affected their relationship with God, it affected everything. They were kicked out of the garden. They now lived in the desert wilderness of their sin, separated from God who was in the garden. The fall shows us going from garden with God to wilderness in sin separated from him. But Isaiah says God is going to come and turn the wilderness into a garden. What will God do? God will come and save them. He will come and save them from the slavery of their sin and from the curse. And the whole earth will rejoice at his coming, for it too shall experience salvation. Isaiah 35 verses 3 and 4 says, Therefore strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. Say to those who have anxious hearts, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come with vengeance, with the recompense of God. He will come and save you. And his salvation will reverse the curse. At his coming, the blind will see. The ears of the deaf will be unstopped. The lame shall leap like a deer. The tongue of the mute will sing for joy. When God comes to save his people, even the waters will break forth in the wilderness. Streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool. Thirsty ground shall become springs of water. This is Isaiah 35, 5 through 7. In the eyes of the blind. They'll be opened. When God comes, expect this, that the ears of the deaf will be unstopped. His salvation will reverse the curse. Bodies affected by the curse of sin, those who are lame will begin to leap like deer. The tongue of the mute will actually begin to sing for joy. Waters break forth in the wilderness, streams in the desert, burning sand becoming like a pool. The thirsty ground, springs of water, you see this? New creation, Even the haunt of jackals, the place where jackals lie down, that grass shall become like reeds and rushes, trees and branches, shall spring up. When God comes to save his people, the mute cannot remain silent. The deaf cannot stop sharing what they have heard. The blind must testify to what they have seen. When God comes to save his people, he does so in the person of, of Jesus Christ. And wherever Jesus went, did you not see these things? Did you not see these things happening? The blind made to see, the deaf to hear, and the mute to speak, and the lame to walk. Jesus is not just another prophet like Isaiah, telling of the day when all this shall be so. Jesus comes embodying the new creation, and the curse of sin is reversed wherever he goes. People's bodies are healed. Hungry people in the wilderness are fed. The thirsty at the well are given living water to drink. The unclean to him, when they come to him, they're made holy. The outcast is forgiven and brought home. Jesus turns the wilderness into the garden. Because he, God, is there with them. When God comes to the descendants of Adam, born in sin, born in the wilderness, that place where God is and dwells becomes the garden. You think about this in John chapter 5. All of these different uh, pieces of Isaiah 35 seem to be present in John chapter 5. So I think John is like, hey, remember all of you that read Isaiah 35? We're seeing this happening here in John chapter 5 we see Jesus doing this very thing. In John chapter 5, Jesus comes, if you remember, to a man lying by a pool in Jerusalem, by the sheep gate. In Aramaic, it's called Bethesda, which has five roofed colonnades, basically um, structures with shelter over top of them. In these lay a multitude of invalids. They were blind lame, and paralyzed. Can you imagine the scene? 
A multitude, the Bible says. More than that can be counted. Thousands of people there, blind, lame, paralyzed, surrounded by this pool, hoping and believing. If I can just get into that water, if I can just get into that pool, the healing water, when it is stirred, I'll be made well. If I can just get into these healing waters. One man was there who had been an invalid, you remember, for 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there, and the Bible says he knew that he had already been there a long time. He said to him, do you want to be healed? That seems like such an odd question, doesn't it? Do you want to be healed? Why would Jesus ask that question? I mean, what kind of question is that? The guy could say, look at me. I've been this way for 38 years. I have had no one to put me in the pool when the water is stirred up. And when I try and go, another steps before me. The man believed that all he needed to do was get his body placed in the healing water and he would be made well. But he could not get there. No one could get him there. This man would need those healing waters to somehow come to him. And that is exactly what Jesus did. Jesus is the healing water in the desert wasteland. Jesus told the man to take up his mat and walk. And the man did just that. He was healed immediately. He was found later and Jesus told him, see, look, you are healed. Now go and sin no more, lest something worse happen to you. Notice that Jesus did not just heal all of the people at the pool that day. He could have spoken one word and healed them all as easily as he healed the one. But no, he comes specifically to this man. This man who, notice, also did not ask to be healed. Jesus came to him and asked him if he wanted to be made well. He asked him what seems to be such an obvious answer. Seeing that the text says Jesus knew the man had been there a long time. But I ask you the same today. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be made well? Do you want to be made whole? Some of you are terrified of being healed. Why would you be terrified of being healed? Because when we're healed, we have no excuse to leave here and continue in that same sin. That same sin that brings us back every single Sunday. Brings us back to sit by the pool but never actually getting in. The man did not tell Jesus, yes, I want to be healed. He said, I don't have anyone to carry me in the water. I've been this way 38 years. He doesn't say he wants to be healed. He gives Jesus an excuse for why he is this way. That's interesting, right? This is just who I am. This is how it's always been. 38 years that way. Can you imagine? You can't even imagine 365 days that way. Imagine 38 years that way. Some people today give the same excuse. I was born this way, right? Do you want to be healed? Eh, I was born this way. I am who I am. That's just my personality. That part of me doesn't need healing. How many of us rely too heavily on those sorts of excuses to be healed. Say things like, I have to cut corners. I don't make enough money. Or I'm not gossiping and slandering. I just needed to vent. I'm not lazy. I just haven't found a job that I enjoy yet. Or this one, I'm not judgmental. I'm just honest. I'm not addicted. I just don't want to quit. I'm not self-righteous. I just don't really like other people. Excuses. This is just the way I am. The way I've always been. My personality. What's the thing that you're holding on to this morning? That Jesus stands over you, before you, and asks, do you want to be healed? What is it that you know is not right in your life? What is it that you keep excusing? What sin is it that keeps robbing you of your joy? 
It is not joy in all these things to be judgmental, to be addicted, to presume self-righteousness. It's exhausting. To be lazy, to gossip, to slander, might feel good for a second. Brings you no joy. It's fleeting. Cutting corners. What is robbing you of your joy? What you've been doing, saying, or maybe even excusing for 38 years that needs to be addressed, that needs to be healed. If you want to be healed, there is good news for you. We can go to the healer. For in the midst of the wilderness, Isaiah says, in Isaiah 35, 8 through 10, a highway shall be there. A highway, and it shall be called the way of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it. I think because when the unclean pass upon it, they become clean and holy before they make it to the other side. It shall belong to those who walk on the way. Even if they are fools, they shall not go astray. Thank you, Lord. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there on this way of holiness. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, having been healed, singing with everlasting joy upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Our passage begins in a desert wasteland, but then peeking through the snow comes hope. Life springs forth from death. The cursed wilderness is turned into a fruitful garden because God has returned to his people. So all who are enslaved to sin can be set free. And that means you too. All who have sinned and are separated from God can be brought back to fellowship with him just by walking on the road, the way of holiness. Jesus is the way. He's the truth and the life, and no one comes back to the Father except through him. Amen? But what about those of you who feel hopeless in the wilderness? or who try and hide the fact that you are in desperate need of healing. Remember in John 5, it is God who comes to us. It is God who searches that one out, even in a room full of people who need healing. The road is not a road that we must search and find, praise the Lord. People talk all the time about how they, quote, found God. No, you didn't. He found you. God was not the one who was lost. We were. He found us. The highway of God, the gate, the door, the way, is not some yellow brick road for you and me and Adam and Eve to travel back to the Garden of Eden. The hope is not that Adam and Eve will find their way back to the Garden, but that God will come and bring the Garden to them. For if it was up to us, brothers and sisters, we'd have about as much luck trying to get back to the garden as that invalid man trying to get into the pool. Our hope this morning and the hope of the world is that Jesus has come to meet us in our wilderness, in our desert wasteland. And he brings the glory of God in the garden with him. He takes a broken home, which is full of burning sand and makes it into a pool. He takes a marriage that's hanging on by a thread full of sorrow and sighing and he turns it into gladness and joy. He takes a man or a woman looking at their bank account and their bills with great anxiety and fear and he places them upon a rock because they refuse to build their house on the sand. Isaiah says, the word of the Lord says, strengthen those weak hands. Make firm those feeble knees. Say to those who have anxious heart, be strong, fear not. Behold, your God will come and save you. Do you want to be healed? Take up your mat and walk. When we can all, I think everyone in this room could testify to this to some degree or the other. 
that when a husband and wife or when a father and his family, when a single guy or gal, no matter your age, no matter who you are, what's your story, from whatever desert you find yourself this morning, it doesn't matter. This good news is for you. If you can hear the voice of Jesus calling to you, it's time to get up. It's it's time to begin to walk on the road of the redeemed. And I can promise you there is no lame man that won't begin to leap. No mute man that won't begin to sing. The deaf will hear, the blind will see the glory of the Lord when God comes to save his people. Might have some blind here this morning testify of what they've seen. Some deaf testify to what they've heard. Jesus will come to find you. And he will save you from the slavery of your sin. And make you into a new creation. And all God's people said, amen. And one day, Christ shall return. Jesus will come again. And we shall all witness, every knee bowed, every tongue confessing, all the redeemed singing and shouting for joy. Even the mountains will bow down, seas roar, the sound of his name. The dead in Christ, the Bible says, shall rise first. Their bodies freed from the curse of death, glorified and holy. We too shall be caught up and made like them. In the twinkling of an eye, we'll all be changed. And all creation, all creation shall be saved from the curse of sin and death, which shall never again take away our joy. The sand won't even burn our eight-year-old feet. (laughs) The winds and the waves will obey him. Yes, even the desert shall rejoice with joy and singing, for all the earth shall see the glory of the Lord and the majesty of our God. Amen. Let us pray.